When is a vector not a vector? My name is Bill Smythe. I'm a professor of oceanography at Oregon State University, and I'm going to talk with you for a few minutes about a precise definition of vectors for use in the physical sciences. In elementary math courses, we often define a vector simply as a list of numbers. And if you're an economist, say, that definition works fine. But for a vector to represent a physical quantity existing in a three-dimensional space, it has to be more carefully defined. There are many examples of quantities represented by vectors, position, velocity, force, etc. The point here is to understand the concept better by looking at something that looks like a vector, but is not. I actually had a hard time finding an example of this to show you, because things that aren't vectors don't get used much in physical science. But I was able to find something. It has to do with measuring the motion of waves on the ocean surface. This photo was taken from the air, and it shows a train of waves approaching the Oregon coast. These are actually internal waves, but that doesn't matter today. The little dot is a ship, and on that ship are me and my colleagues trying to learn something useful about the motion of those waves. Here's a cartoon of a sequence of wave crests seen from above, moving in a direction perpendicular to themselves as plane waves do. Now, suppose we deployed a sensor that could measure the height of the sea surface at any given time. So here's our sensor that measures sea surface height. The sensor records the height, h, as a function of time, t. So, if you watched as time progresses, you'd see a crest go by, and then a trough, then another crest, and so on as these pass by the sensor. If we want to, we can measure the period of the wave train, i.e. the time it takes between successive crests. But there's nothing in this measurement to tell us how fast the wave is actually moving. For that, we need at least one more sensor. The separation of the two sensors will be defined as the x direction, and the distance between them we'll call delta x. From the second sensor, we get a similar record of alternating crests and troughs, but there's a difference in the time at which the crests pass the two sensors. See, there's a time lag, and it's this time lag that allows us to measure the speed of the wave. Suppose we now measure that time lag, and we call it delta t. We could then divide delta x, the difference between the sensors, by the time lag, delta t, to get a speed in meters per second, say. Let's call that speed Cx. For example, suppose the distance between sensors is 50 meters and the time lag is 25 seconds. Then we would divide and get that Cx is 2 meters per second. We might be tempted to call this the speed of the wave and go home, but we would likely be wrong. That's because this measurement doesn't tell us anything about the direction that the waves are propagating in. If we were lucky, the waves could be moving in a direction parallel to the line separating the two sensors, i.e. in the x direction. If that were true, then Cx actually would be the speed of the waves. In fact, we would probably try to deploy the sensors in that way. but. Deploying sensors from a moving ship is tricky, and there would almost certainly be some error. In any case, the wave direction would be likely to change over time. So we just can't count on things arranging themselves in this neat, tidy way. Suppose instead we were unlucky, and the waves were moving in a direction that's markedly different from the direction of the line separating the two sensors. Wave crests would then pass by our two sensors in very quick succession, and the speed we would measure would be much greater than the speed of the wave. For example, the time lag might be only 5 seconds, say. With delta x still being 50 meters, this would give us a speed of 10 meters per second. So, our measurement yields a different speed just because the waves are moving in a different direction. That's not a very good measurement.
In fact, if the angle were sharp enough, the wave crests might even pass the two sensors at exactly the same time, in which case the speed we measure would be infinite. Obviously, that would not be a very good measure of the actual speed of the waves. We need more information, and the obvious way to get it is to deploy more sensors. Suppose we deploy a third sensor at right angles to the first two, and we call its separation from the first sensor delta y. We can now repeat the same calculation, dividing delta y by the time lag for crests to pass the new sensor. Let's call the result cy. For example, perhaps delta y would be 60 meters and delta t would be 20 seconds and we divide to get 3 meters per second. So maybe now we know everything we need to know about the motion of this wave. We have two quantities, cx and cy, and we can arrange them into a list and call it the velocity of the wave. It looks like a velocity. It has two components. They both have units of meters per second. This is, in fact, what we call the phase velocity. But there's a problem. Suppose that some other guys come along and they want to measure the motion of this wave train also. Suppose they deployed their sensors in different places than ours. So here's their sensor, here's our sensor. For simplicity, we'll assume that their first sensor is close to ours, but the other two are placed differently. The result is that their sensors will be separated by a different pair of directions. Let's call them x prime and y prime. So the separations between their sensors are delta x prime and delta y prime. They can now go ahead and make the same measurement we did and analyze the data in the same way and get two speeds, which they'll call cx prime and cy prime. If they want to, they can then pack their two speeds together into a vector and call that the velocity of the wave train. The trouble is, if we compare our results, we'll find that their vector is not the same as our vector. Why? What's wrong? Are their instruments malfunctioning? Did they do the math wrong? Did we do the math wrong? Are aliens messing with our brains? What's going on here? After a few seconds thought, of course we'll realize the most likely reason is simply that we defined the x and y axes differently. So we're comparing apples and oranges. To conduct a meaningful comparison, we have to figure out what their result would have been if they had aligned their sensors in the same direction as ours. This is easy to figure out. We'll go through the details of this in class, but by using simple trigonometry, we can take their measured speeds, cx prime and cy prime, and perform a coordinate rotation so that they pertain to our coordinate axes, x and y. Trouble is, it still doesn't work. Even after the coordinate rotation, our phase velocity and their phase velocity will be different. Even if the instruments are perfect and nobody made a math error, the results will not agree. Guaranteed. To show the discrepancy visually, you could plot each phase velocity as an arrow with a length and a direction, and you'd find that they're not the same. Here's ours, here's theirs. This is not a toy example. It's a practical, real-life problem, and if we can't resolve it, then we all go home having learned nothing about those waves, and that's bad, because going to sea in a boat is expensive. The discrepancy shows, actually, that phase velocity is not a vector. It's not a vector. Why not? It's a list of numbers. It has x and y components. It has a magnitude and a direction. Wait a minute, stop that. Go away. Okay. It has a magnitude and a direction. The problem is, the phase velocity depends on the way in which we measure it. When we think of a wave's velocity, we're imagining a quantity that is purely an attribute of that wave train. It doesn't matter who's measuring it or how, but the phase velocity isn't like that. It also depends intrinsically on the way you define the directions, x and y. A vector is a quantity with magnitude and direction that are independent of the observer. Phase velocity doesn't qualify.
It has some uses, but it's not a vector. There is actually a better alternative. You can form a vector from the reciprocals, 1 over cx and 1 over cy, and then divide by the sum of the squares, 1 over cx squared plus 1 over cy squared. The result is a vector, a real vector, whose magnitude is the speed of the wave crests and whose direction is the direction that the waves are moving in. Best of all, it doesn't matter who measures it or how they do it. If they place their instruments differently, their measurements will yield different numbers, but we can easily correct for that, and when we do, we'll find that the results are consistent. Because of this, we know that we've learned something that is really about the waves. It's not just about us and our measurement choices. In other words, let me stress this again, this velocity is an intrinsic property of physical reality, the waves in this case, and it doesn't care about the observer. Every day, waves like this are rolling onto the Oregon coast, and maybe I'm measuring them, or maybe you're measuring them, or most likely nobody is, but that doesn't matter to the waves. They're just out there doing their thing, and their thing is what we're interested in. That's why we like to work with vectors. It's not that we never deal with quantities that aren't vectors, but only when it's necessary, and only with caution. So, in summary, how do we define a vector? Mathematically, we define it by the way it transforms under a coordinate rotation, and we'll go into that elsewhere. But this rather abstract definition exists for a very practical reason. It follows from the requirement that the quantity has its own identity that is independent of the method used to measure it. Vectors are an example of a more general class of mathematical objects called tensors. Every quantity that describes physical reality independent of the observer is expressed most usefully as a tensor. We'll look at tensors in another video.